This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Sometimes, when presented with a project that is decidedly outside of my wheelhouse, I look at it and say, yes. And it's not because I'm a fool, or a glutton for punishment, or so hubris as to think I can fix anything, but it's because I'm curious. I relish the challenge, and a change of pace can be nice. This is not the first piece of stoneware, earthenware, ceramics, or pottery that I have conserved, and it likely won't be the last. But in the past, those pieces have largely been simple, big breaks, chips, scratches, or cracks. This, however, is a whole different story, or stories, because there are lots of them in little pieces. When this piece fell from the top of a bookshelf and made contact with the floor, it nearly exploded into a million little pieces. And while the client was wise enough to sweep and vacuum up all of those little pieces, some of them are almost dust and probably can't be saved. And though this is not a painting, I will take the same controlled, disciplined, and methodical approach that I normally would and try to figure out a way to put this piece back together. I'm sure it will challenge me in ways I'm not yet aware of, but when I deliver it back to my client, I want them to be anything but shattered. While this project may seem like it's about a piece of broken pottery, it's actually about taking lots of pieces and assembling them to one unified whole. You know, like a website. No, 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 hear me out. You may have a web page, and you may want a gallery, and you may want an e-commerce solution, and you may want an email list, and you may want search engine optimization, and you may want scheduling, and there are so many other things that you may want but not know how to integrate them. And that's why you need Squarespace. But it's also the things you don't know you need that Squarespace provides, like tutorials, video walkthroughs, articles, and a robust forum to help you out when you need help. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. The first thing that I'm going to do after I spend a very long time thinking about what I'm going to do and delaying doing anything is get to work. And for this piece, I start off with a roll of tape and a magic marker. Before I can even think about gluing this piece back together, I have to figure out how it goes together. I have to start assembling this three-dimensional puzzle and figure out where all of the pieces go. Some of them are pretty obvious. These big ones go right together, and that's why I start with them, to give myself a base. And I'm using some tape just to hold it together. This tape is not permanent and it will go away, but I don't want to start off with adhesives. I want to start off with something that is forgiving. If I need to peel it back, I can. I don't want any of this preparatory work to be permanent. Now the nice thing about working with a three-dimensional object is that when the piece fits, it really fits. These pieces go together and the seams are almost completely invisible, and so it's really easy to figure out how it goes together, at least in the beginning. And at this point, I'm very confident. I feel like I have the wind in my sails, and this is going to be a swift and easy project. <laughs> easy. Yeah, right. As I start to get to the smaller and smaller pieces and exhaust all of the obvious moves, it does start to get a little bit more complicated. Not only because I have to start to figure out where they go, and this piece is almost completely composed of green and blue and a little bit of brown, so it's not like a puzzle where I can sort it into different color fields and then work from there, but also because the pieces get more difficult to fit. You see, the breaks are tinier, and the angles of these pieces don't always line up, and so it's not as simple as just plopping one in place and it fits magically. But through the use of a lot more tape and patience, and patience, and did I mention patience? It's starting to come together. 
Now at this point, I have exhausted all of the big pieces and it is helpful to turn to the foam onto which I'm working to make sure I don't chip or break any of the other pieces and try to assemble some of the smaller pieces into medium sized pieces that I can then fit into the larger assembly. Woodworkers will often do this in complex glue ups, take some of the smaller pieces and assemble them and then assemble all of the medium sized pieces rather than try to do it all at once in one fell swoop. It's just a little bit more controlled and it gives you a little bit more perspective. Now at this point, I'm starting to realize that this vase or piece of pottery is really unstable. And even though I've used a lot, a lot, a lot of tape to hold it together, it's still flexing. And I don't want it to break, and it's also getting harder to fit things in. So I'm going to make a support, kind of a substructure, onto which I can rest this. So I've turned to a piece of heavy-duty, acid-free blotter paper. This is the same stuff that I use in the studio for paintings. And I've just traced out a piece and cut it to fit. I'm going to do the same, and I'm going to make effectively a dome so that the piece has something to rest on and isn't stressed as I handle it. I thought about using expanding foam, but that would put too much pressure on the piece and distort it. I also thought about carving something out of wood, getting a lathe, <laughs> making it much more difficult for me, but ultimately this is gonna work fine. And this is not permanent. This is just temporary while I work on it so that it doesn't distort and flex or that the joints aren't stressed. I have to shape this paper a little bit because it's pretty stiff and resistant, but eventually I get it oriented how I want it and then I can just tape it together. And just like that, a couple of pieces of paper will provide enough support to hold this ceramic in its shape and distribute that load evenly. So I'm going to notch that as an easy win. I've got plenty of more difficult challenges ahead of me, so I'm going to take every win that I can get. Now I can manipulate this piece without worrying about it distorting. So on to more tiny pieces. The other benefit here is that I can start to align things without taping them into place. I can lay them up against this uh, substructure and see where they go, even if I'm not sure. I can move them around, and as I continue to put the pieces into place, this substructure will support everything, even if it's not fully taped. Now, at this point, I have to start thinking about actually putting it back together with an adhesive. And I can't just go out to the store and buy something like a crazy glue or a polyurethane glue because I want all of this to be archival and fully reversible. Yes, that's right. I'm going to make my own fully reversible adhesive. And it starts by weighing out some resin. I use this resin in various points in the studio. And in this case, I'm going to convert it into an adhesive. So after measuring out solvent, adding a bulking agent, I will then put the resin in that cheesecloth into this jar and suspend it. I don't want it touching the bottom. I want the resin to dissolve slowly through the cheesecloth over a period of a couple of days. Once it's done that, I effectively have my resin glue all made. But in a big jar, it's not going to help me much. I need to put it in a delivery method that's more suitable. So I'm going to make my own tubes of glue. Pouring the glue into these aluminum tubes and then pinching and cinching the bottom, I now have three tubes of glue. I'll put a label on them so I know what I have and we can get to work. One of the unique things about this approach and this adhesive is that I have to wet out or prime all of the surfaces. Otherwise the stoneware, in this case, will absorb all of the adhesive and the joint will be starved. So I've thinned out the adhesive and I'm painting it on all of the raw edges and then the stoneware is going to absorb this and it will be a surface that's ready for the adhesive. And yes, even though this is being absorbed, it can be removed. This is a solvent based adhesive. And so by exposing this edge to solvent, I can draw out all of this adhesive. This is a technique that is used by paleontologists and archaeologists all around the world for artifacts and dinosaur bones of all types. And no, it's not lost on me that now I don't really remember where all of these pieces go and I'm going to have to reassemble them just like I spent a lot of time doing, but you know what? Them's the breaks. 
Now once I have prepared all of these surfaces, I can take the thicker glue that's in these tubes and simply squeeze it out and apply it to the surface of the brake. And then, once I have enough, I don't need to worry about the excess because I can clean it up later. I'd rather have more glue than less glue in a joint. I can take the piece and press it into place and then hold it. It only takes about 20 or 30 seconds for this adhesive to dry. It's dissolved into a very fast evaporating solvent. And I can change that solvent depending on the properties I want in this adhesive. I can have something that has a long open time or dries really slowly, or in this case, something that dries really fast. So now it's just a matter of finding all the little pieces, applying the adhesive, putting them into place, holding them, getting my fingers completely covered in adhesive, moving on to the next place, doing it again and again and again. And this is really kind of tedious, but there is no faster way to do it. Now there is a lot of glue that is squeezing out of these joints and it's getting all over the surface. And I'm not terribly concerned about that because I will remove it. And because the surface isn't porous, it's not really gonna stick all that well. Yes, it, it will bond, but it's not as strong as the bond to the raw, unglazed ceramic. And so this is how it goes. Little by little, I'm slowly rebuilding this piece. And it's coming together pretty well. I'm really happy with how it's all fitting together. The losses that remain are relatively small, and though I'll have to fill them in, it's not that much. After a lot of gluing, probably a full day of piecing this back together with the adhesive, well, it's back together, and it looks fantastic, except for all of that glue squeeze out that's all over. So I'm taking a sharp scalpel, and I'm just slicing and prying and chipping off all of the residue. Now, if I had used something like a cyanoacrylate, or crazy glue, a polyurethane glue, or an epoxy, not only would this not be archival or reversible, but getting the residue off might not be possible because those have different types of bonds. But this one isn't that crazy strong, at least not on a glazed surface, it's not. So I'm going to chip off all of the big squeeze outs because it's easier than removing them with a swab. And once I've done that, then I will turn to a cotton ball saturated with the solvent I use to mix the adhesive, and I'll begin removing off the rest. Now, I don't want the cotton ball to be dripping wet with the solvent. I want it to be damp so that the solvent makes contact with the adhesive and softens it, but it doesn't get wicked into the joint and compromise the joint because that would effectively undo all of the work I've done. Now, because some of the losses were pretty significant and go all the way through, they're not just chips, I have to build them up, at least make some more body onto which I can add the fill-in medium. So I'm using a two-part sculpting epoxy here. And I know this is an epoxy, and I just talked about how that wouldn't be appropriate. But keep in mind, this epoxy is only coming in contact with surfaces that already have the reversible glue on them. So this can be removed just by using the solvent to weaken that joint. 
That's another reason why we make sure to coat all of the surfaces that are exposed with that archival reversible resin adhesive. So I'm just going to force this putty into the voids and then using a whole bunch of tools here, beginning with a scalpel, I'm going to start removing the excess. I want this to be just a little bit shy of the surface because I'm going to come back and fill this in with a different putty later on. This is just effectively to give me something for that putty to stick to that's more structurally sound than the putty, which is relatively weak in large areas. It's fine as a medium onto which we can retouch, but as a structural medium, it just doesn't cut it. And this is much more structural. And then I'll come back with dental tools and I'll start sculpting this to match. And again, I don't need it to be perfect, I'm just looking for the rough texture and rough shape. I'll refine it later on. But for now, I want to clean off any of the excess epoxy and residue from the surface of this piece. If I don't, it will dry and be almost impossible to remove later on. Once the epoxy has been allowed to dry, I'll come back in with my regular fill-in medium, yes, the same one I use on paintings, and begin building up a surface onto which I can retouch. And just like working on a painting, this is a matter of filling in the voids and making a texture that matches. And here I'm using some little silicone sculpting tools to get into the little nooks and crannies and shape it. Again, this is pretty rough, but that's okay because the surface of this piece is pretty rough and I can always come back later on with dental tools and shape it how I want. Right now I'm just trying to build up the first pass and I'll probably have to take a couple of passes to get this perfect. But one of the things I want to be mindful of is making sure that all of the little cracks, the hairline cracks, get filled in because those catch the light and they betray the overall piece. If you see those little cracks, it's much like seeing a different texture on a painting. Doesn't matter how good the color matching is, you're going to see it. And while this piece will probably live back up on the top bookshelf, I still want to make sure that upon close inspection, it looks as good as it possibly can. Once all of that fill-in medium has dried, it is now onto the wonderful step of removing all of the excess. And just like with a painting, I need water and a little bit of friction. It's not terribly difficult, but here I need to use a little bit more water because, of course, the surface is rougher, and I don't want any of this excess residue sticking to or in any of these nooks and crannies because that would be problematic as it would leave a white haze. So it takes a little bit more time than going over painting, but, you know, it's a small piece. I can afford the time, and, you know, it's my job. I chose to do this, so complaining is not in the cards. I'll use swabs and dental tools and some felt and shop towels, really anything I have, including my fingers, to get all of this excess residue off. And you can see it really does stick in those little nooks and crannies. But this is necessary because it's going to fill in all of those voids and create a surface for my retouching medium. And that is the next step. For this piece, I'm going to be using an archival high pigment water-based medium. It's effectively a watercolor. And I'm going to use this because it is a matte paint. Unlike the retouching paints that I normally use, which have a little bit of gloss in them, this doesn't. The other reason that I'm using this, because it's water-based, it's not going to activate or compromise the adhesive that I used to glue this piece back together. If I use the regular retouching medium, the solvent that's necessary to soften up that resin could compromise those joints, and then we'd have a disaster. And just like retouching a painting, it's a matter of color matching and applying paint only where paint is missing. Just in three dimensions, which is so much easier, right? Right.
What arrived in a million little pieces contained in Ziploc bags, shattered from a fall, has been conserved and restored to its former glory. All of the pieces that were salvageable were put back together, reunited with their neighbor. The losses were filled in, and the voids retouched, and now the damage is imperceptible. The owner can now view this piece not as a relic of what was, or a symbol of loss, but as they've always known it, and enjoy it as such. And the piece can now go back into their lives, into their home, and onto their bookshelf, though hopefully this time with a safety tether, just in case. <laughs>